Hey everybody and welcome to Pharmacology. Um, this is going to be a, a fun and exciting module, I hope. I really like this stuff, so I hope you enjoy it too. Today we're going to start by talking about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, which is sort of the very basic science of pharmacology and how drugs work. So let's go. So pharmacology is the study of drugs. Probably knew that already, but now we're going to talk pharmacokinetics, which is the drug movement in the body, and pharmacodynamics. So that's the biological and physiological effects of that drug on the body. Clinical pharmacology, uh, by definition, is the effective use of drugs in a clinical setting. And that's what we're really going to focus on in this course, because, of course, you guys are clinical uh, clinical practitioners, so you need to know how to use pharmacology effectively in your patients. What is the role of the veterinary technician in pharmacology? Inventory control. So you guys are basically in charge of the pharmacy and making sure that things are kept there and drugs are kept there um, so that as they are needed, they are available to be used. Drug administration. You guys do a lot of administration of drugs by mouth, by injection, that sort of thing. Um, patient monitoring. Uh, of course, you guys know that you do a lot of that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you monitor patients, inpatients, outpatients. Uh, you'll take samples, blood samples, um, to check for levels of drugs. Uh, you'll be very heavily involved in the monitoring of the effects of drugs uh, on patients. And then client education. You guys are really the, the ones who tend to be sending animals home on medications. Um, of course, as veterinarians, we'll prescribe those medications, but it'll be your job to, to educate the client on what to expect uh, with each specific medication, and they will count on you for that. So again, the definition of pharmacokinetics is the movement of drugs in the body. So I will sometimes call it PK just because it's easier. So PK determines drug doses, so how much of the drug you have to give, dosing regimen, so basically how often you have to give it, and withdrawal times. I don't, I'm not sure if you guys remember what withdrawal times are, but withdrawal times is basically the time after giving a medication that you have to wait before an animal can be slaughtered for use uh, in human food. So, of course, that's only really relevant to uh, livestock. Uh, so dogs and cats, we don't worry about withdrawal times, um, but certainly any of you who are working with large animals will be very familiar with them. There are a few clinically relevant parameter, parameters that we'll look at, the first, the first one being half-life. These we will go into in, in some detail, so don't worry too much about, about what they are. So half-life of a drug, its volume of distribution, in the body, the clearance of the drug, and the bioavailability of a drug. So here we are, pharmacokinetics, what the body does to the drug. Um, one way you can remember this, if it works for you, is um, add me. So that's absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. That's what the body does to the drug. So if it has to do with add me, then that's pharmacokinetics. So that's something that's kind of a helpful thing when you're trying to figure out if it's something the drug does to the body or if it's something the body does to the drug. So let's talk drug absorption. That's the uptake of a substance. So a substance is taken up from the site of administration, goes through the circulation, and then it goes into the tissues or the site of action. So Basically, that's what we want to have happen, right? We want to make sure that the drug gets to where it's needed. If I have an infection in my big toe, it's not going to do me much good to have an antibiotic in my thumb. This only makes sense. Um, where do we administer drugs? Oh, topically on the skin, orally, gastrointestinal tract, um, by inhalation in the respiratory tract, so subcutaneously, intramuscular, intravenous, all of these things are, are very common sites of administration of drugs. Absorption actually ends in the organs, organs of uh, metabolism and elimination. So metabolism is your liver, your gastrointestinal tract, and your kidney. These can metabolize drugs, and, and uh, different organs are responsible for the metabolism of different drugs, and then they get eliminated through the kidney, maybe through the bile or the gastrointestinal tract. So that's where absorption ends. Two things are required 
for absorption and distribution of a drug. You have to have a concentration gradient. So what that means is you have to have a higher concentration of the drug outside the cell than inside the cell. Otherwise, the drug is going to want to move out of the cell rather than in. Chemical properties uh, that allow it to cross cell membranes. So drugs need to be lipid soluble if they actually want to get in to um, a cell, non-ionic, uncharged. So glucocorticoids, fluoroquinolones, these sorts of things are very easily absorbed because of, they have those properties. We do have water-soluble drugs, so these are often poorly absorbed and distributed because if you think about cell membranes, they're made up of phospholipids. So if something is not lipid-soluble, it's going to have a harder time getting into a cell. So water-soluble drugs like aminoglycosides, that's a kind of an antibiotic, and heparin, these are given by injection usually because that's how we can better achieve therapeutic blood levels. We don't have to rely on the drug's ability to get in through the cells, say, in our gastrointestinal tract and get absorbed into the circulation. So a key point here about drug absorption is that drugs that are lipophilic diffuse more readily into tissue than do hydrophilic drugs. So lipophilic drugs, of course, means um, fat-loving drugs. Hydrophilic drugs are water-loving drugs. So lipophilic drugs diffuse more readily into tissue because they can get through those um, cell membranes. But lipophilic drugs um, actually are more difficult to absorb into the bloodstream because they are not easily soluble in the blood, whereas hydrophilic drugs will dissolve easily in the blood. So this is a little diagram just to show that here. So we've got our least soluble lipophilic drug, but they're more permeable. They get into tissues better. And then we get our most soluble hydrophilic drugs, but they get into tissues with more difficulty. Make sense? Bioavailability is defined as the fraction of a drug dose that reaches the bloodstream. This is actually a function of absorption and metabolism. So say we're comparing intravenous dosing of a drug versus oral, so PO. Drugs delivered IV are 100% bioavailable. So 100% of the drug it makes it from the dosing syringe into the bloodstream. Whereas if we give something by mouth, it's significantly less bioavailable. We're giving it by mouth that has to go through the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, a, so there's a certain amount of it that's going to just get excreted and never get never get absorbed into the bloodstream. So it is less bioavailable. So for instance, butorphanol, torp, it's only 20% bioavailable when given by mouth. So you give a drug, you give the drug by mouth, you'll have to give five times as much of it to get to the same uh, blood concentration as you would with a 100% bioavailability that it has given IV. Hope that makes sense. All right, let's talk about drug distribution. That's the movement of an absorbed drug from the blood to the various tissues of the body. So we've already had the drug absorbed, so that was absorption, our first step, into the bloodstream. And now we have to get it to the tissues in the body where it needs to be. So that's drug distribution. Now the volume of distribution is basically an estimate of the distribution of drug in the body. Like where is it? Where is it getting to? That's the volume of distribution. Now, if we're talking lipid soluble non-ionic drugs, these move by passive diffusion across cell membranes. Well, that makes sense, remember, because lipophilic drugs or lipid soluble drugs are going to be able to make it through that phospholipid bilayer that makes up our cell membranes. So they're going to diffuse across these cell membranes and they can enter the extracellular and intracellular compartments. So really, really good for anything that you need to get inside a cell. This results in a relatively high volume of distribution because it's in the tissues, it's in the extracellular fluids. Great. Water-soluble drugs, on the other hand, are limited to the extracellular compartment. Remember, they are not able to make it through that phospholipid bilayer into our cells. So they're going to sit between the cells in the tissues, which is most of the time where they're needed anyways, right? So they have a lower volume of distribution, but that doesn't mean that they're less effective. It means they're effective against different things. Let's talk about influences on drug distribution. So first, a drug's chemical properties will definitely affect the distribution of that drug. We'll talk about a few of them here. A lot of them we don't need to worry too much about. Um, relative tissue blood flow. So this is kind of evident when you think about it. So if you have a tissue that has higher perfusion, say 
the kidneys, you will have a higher drug concentration there than you would have maybe in the tips of your fingers or something where there's lower perfusion. Protein binding. So a protein bound drug, which is exactly what it sounds like, it's a drug that is attached to a protein. It stays in the intravascular space and it does that because the proteins are large enough that they can't just diffuse out of the blood vessels. So it keeps the drug in that intravascular space and it, and, and as long as it's bound to a protein, it's not having its effect. So that's an important thing to know. Tissue binding. So if a drug has a high affinity for tissue, that drug will accumulate in tissues. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, now, anatomic barriers. So this is where we start getting a little complicated. So the big one that it's really important to know about is the blood-brain barrier. This is an anatomic barrier that prevents um, a lot of the, the solutes, things that are dissolved in the blood from actually making it into the brain. It's designed to protect your brain because it's quite sensitive to a lot of things, including drugs. It has a P glycoprotein pump, and this actually pumps those substances out of cells to protect the brain. So your brain is not getting the same concentration of a lot of things as the rest of your body. Remember, this is clinically important for you guys. Collies and a few other breeds, especially breeds that are related to collies, have a genetic mutation that actually results in a non-functioning P glycoprotein pump. So these guys are at risk of neurotoxicity due to inadequate blood-brain barrier. And the biggest example of that is ivermectin toxicity. Most animals deal with it just fine but if because of the blood-brain barrier, but of course if you give it to a, a collie that has a non-functional blood-brain barrier, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. That drug is going to make it into the brain and it's going to cause toxicity. There are some other barriers in the body within the gastrointestinal tract, kidneys, placenta, and testis. I'm not going to go into detail on those, but they are there and they do interfere with distribution. Okay, we're moving on to the M in ADME, drug metabolism. So another word for metabolism is biotransformation, which I think is potentially a better word for it anyway. So what is that? It's the, the chemical modification of a drug, and it modifies that drug to potentially an active, an inactive, or potentially even a toxic metabolite. So usually, what metabolism is responsible for is inactivating, detoxifying, potentially making drugs more water soluble so that they can be eliminated from the body in the urine or the bile. One example of where metabolism is obviously very, very important is with prodrugs. So these are drugs that we administer in an inactive form and we rely on the liver usually, to metabolize them to their active form. So the most common example of this in veterinary medicine probably is prednisone being a steroid. Prednisone is the inactive form of prednisolone. And in case I don't mention it later, uh, prednisolone has to be given to cats in its active form because cats do not metabolize prednisone to prednisolone effectively. So if your vet is prescribing prednisone to a cat, it might be be worthwhile to just mention or remind him or her of that, let's say, um, that cats really do require prednisolone to have an, a, a good effect. There is a very significant role of enzyme systems in drug metabolism, as you probably expect. So within the gastrointestinal tract, the liver and the kidneys, uh, these are working to metabolize drugs. And liver is the major site of drug metabolism. phases of drug metabolism. So phase one, we have enzymes that actually are metabolizing drugs by oxidation. Oxidation means they're taking away electrons. Reduction, which means that electrons are being added, or hydrolysis, which, which happens when water is added to a chemical. And this all relies on cytochrome P450 enzymes, and these are found in the liver. Phase two. So in phase two, enzymes conjugate or add a substance to the drug to inactivate it and facilitate its elimination. You've probably heard of conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin, and that's exactly what that's talking about. So conjugated bilirubin is bilirubin that's been through the liver. It's had a substance basically added to it that's inactivated it and got it set up to go through usually through the biliary tree, into the gastrointestinal tract and eliminated. So it's conjugation. Now we're at the E. So drug elimination. 
Drug elimination is the removal of the drug from the body. Self-explanatory. The You might think that, you know, urine is pretty much the root of drug elimination for most drugs, and you would probably be correct, but there are a lot of other ways that the drugs can get out of there. So bile, feces, expired air, especially with our anesthetic gases, milk, sweat, saliva, tears, all of these can actually help drugs be eliminated from the body. And of course, kidney is our major route. Elimination through the kidney is influenced by a few things. Uh, water solubility obviously being a big one, because if the drug is not soluble in water, it's not going to make it into the urine very easily. Uh, protein binding, urine pH, flow rate, renal blood flow, all these things are important. And of course, loss of kidney function will cause drugs to accumulate in the body. This is really important when you're looking at an animal and trying to decide what kind of dose you should be giving of a certain drug. If this is an animal in renal failure and we know that this drug is eliminated through the kidneys, well, we need to really worry about that. We need to worry about how much of that drug we need to actually give. And we'll probably decide that we're going to give a lower dose. Clearance. So drug clearance is the rate at which the drug is removed from the body. So elimination is the body basically getting rid of a drug. Clearance is the rate at which that happens. It's actually expressed as the volume of plasma cleared of drug per unit time, so mils per minute. It is a measure of efficiency of drug elimination, and it's actually used to determine the dosage regime necessary to achieve a stable concentration in the blood. This information is going to be able to be found in books, textbooks, formularies, that sort of thing. Most of the time, this is not something that you'll need to worry about clinically, but it's important to understand what it is. There are some factors that affect clearance. Again, the rate at which the drug is being removed from the body. Protein binding. Remember, protein binding keeps drugs in the bloodstream. Organ perfusion. Um, drug metabolizing, metabolizing enzymes and renal elimination. So uh, these are all important factors in determining how quickly we can get rid of a drug. Right, the steady state of a drug is an important concept for you to understand. It occurs when there is a stable concentration of drug in the blood. And that state is reached when the amount of drug that you're administering to this animal is equal to the amount of drug being eliminated. So here's a little gra graphic representation of this. And you see her here on the left, the concentration of the drug in the blood. Um, and then down here is the time. So the multiples of elimination half time, that just means basically the number of half lives of the drug. So here we go. We give a dose of the drug and we know how often we're supposed to dose it based on the research that's been done on the drug and its half life. So we dose it again. We dose it three times and four times. And here we go. We're getting here in the fifth or so time here, we're really, really into a steady state, meaning that each time we give it, the peak concentration is basically the same and the trough concentration is both basically the same. So you can see we get to the steady state here, the average concentration levels off. So the time to steady state is independent of the dosage, but it's usually attained after approximately four or really five half-lives. So then we get to that steady state and usually the drug will be effective at both the peak and the trough concentrations for most drugs. So we try to keep them in that window. Okay, here we are talking about half-life. The time required for the amount of a drug to decrease by one half or 50% in the bloodstream, that is the half-life. This is um, a characteristic of a drug and it's used to estimate the dosing interval. How often do we have to give this drug to make sure we get to a steady state concentration and keep it in that, basically in that window of effective concentrations of the drug. So the time needed to reach a steady state plasma concentrations or for 97% of a drug to be removed from the body is approximately five times the half-life. Okay, so the bottom line when we're talking about pharmacokinetics is that the A, D, so absorption and distribution of a drug are the factors that really influence the ability of that drug to reach its desired site of action. And then the M and the E, metabolism and elimination, affect the length of time that drug is in the body. So over here we have a, 
oh, let me get my pointer. Over here we have a drug, and let's just say it might be any kind of drug or multiple different drugs. It's just a theoretical drug, and that drug could go, you know, get absorbed into the bloodstream, go through metabolism, become a metabolite, and maybe it's eliminated, you know, through renal elimination. Or maybe it's conjugated and then it goes through the liver and is excreted through the biliary tree. But, you know, these are sort of the sorts of things that, that um, are involved with the pharmacokinetics of a drug in the body. Okay, this is a little case study for you in pharmacokinetics. So a, a horse is experiencing front limb lameness from an injury that occurred during a race. The owner of this horse calls the veterinarian out to the ranch to have the horse examined. The veterinarian determines that the horse needs an anti-inflammatory drug to decrease some of the front limb joint swelling noted on the physical exam. The treatment includes an IM injection of an anti-inflammatory drug. The owner wonders why the injection is being given in the horse's muscle when the horse has pain in its joint. And you might think, oh, well, <laughs> that's kind of a silly question, but it's really not. And a lot of owners have this type of question, so it's great when you can actually answer them for them. So here's what I ask you to think about for the next minute or so. How does the medication get from a muscle to another location in the body? And how do medications get to where they are needed in general? So think about that for a couple of seconds. Okay, here's your answer. So a drug that's given in the muscle will diffuse from the injection site, so that's the extracellular fluid of the muscle, into the blood. From the blood, it's distributed to the front leg where it can be effective. So the blood, always circulating throughout the body, um, brings that drug to where it's needed in the front leg. Drugs from the blood bind to receptors of certain tissues so the drug is going to the joint. There's certain tissues there that are in need of anti-inflammatory effects. So the, the drug binds to those and has the desired reactions. So remember, once a drug gets into the blood, it can travel pretty much anywhere. When an animal is given an antibiotic, bacteria can be killed in any part of the body, not just the one that has the infection. So normal flora in the GI tract are often affected when we use systemic antibiotics to treat anything, so skin, urinary, respiratory, whatever kind of infection it might be. And that's why a lot of times we give probiotics at the same time that we're giving antibiotics. We're trying to replenish basically those bacteria that we're killing off with our antibiotics. All right, we're moving on to pharmacodynamics or PD. So PD is the study of the biochemical and physiologic effects of a drug. In simple terms, it's what the drug does to the body, which is what we're looking for, right? Most of the time, most of it is what we're looking for. So there's some clinically relevant PD parameters, basically a drug's mechanism of action, the relationship between its concentration and its effect. And then of course, side effects or adverse reactions, which are part of pharmacodynamics as well. First, let's talk about the mechanism of action of a drug. So the actual effect or biochemical effect of a drug requires that the drug either have direct physical interaction of cellular components. So you remember those lipophilic drugs that are gonna make it through the cell membrane into the cell, they can have direct physical interaction with cellular components, or they may interact with specific target cellular proteins that result in an alteration of the cell's normal physiology. So those hydrophilic drugs, the ones that can't make it through the cell membrane, can interact with cellular proteins, usually through receptors, right, on the cell surface, and they can actually alter what's going on inside the cell without actually going in themselves. So targets for those drugs include enzymes, carriers, ion channels, receptors, those sorts of things. Pharmacologic compounds can act as either an agonist or an antagonist. You probably remember hearing something about that, especially when we're talking about opioids. We're going to talk about opioids um, in the anesthesia module, but uh, we talk a lot about agonists and antagonists when we talk about opioids. This is a great little schematic for you to look at. So this is 
agonists versus antagonists. So an agonist is a drug that produces a physiologic effect characteristic of the receptor to which it binds. So this is, of course, an opioid. Morphine is a mu receptor agonist that produces analgesia. So agonists, they bind to the target receptor or whatever, and then they have a full activation of physiological effects in that cell. So whatever that receptor was supposed to do, this drug binds to it and it does it. That's an agonist. An antagonist binds to a receptor and blocks its activation. So now we get, say it's naloxone. So naloxone being a mu receptor antagonist, it reverses morphine and other opiates. So we have our antagonist binding to this receptor and preventing activation of the receptor. So whatever this receptor is supposed to do, now that this is bound, is just not going to happen. And there are some other combinations there of um, agonist plus antagonist. We get less activation. We get a little bit of binding from this one, a little bit of binding from that one. We get less activation of the receptor, but still some. There are partial agonists. Um, so that's another thing. This is very similar to a partial agonist. So adverse reactions or side effects, um, they're not quite the same thing, but we'll talk about them in a, the same kind of way. Both of these are undesired effects associated with a drug. So side effects can result from drugs that are interacting with multiple tissue types. So these, remember, these drugs don't go just to the one spot where they're needed. They will distribute throughout the body. So maybe they'll get involved with different tissue types, some of which need the action, some of which don't. Multiple cellular targets. Maybe this drug is targeting, you know, a couple of receptors in this tissue and maybe it actually also targets some ion channels over in another tissue. So multiple cellular targets uh, can be a problem. Alteration in the patient's physiology and or the pharmacokinetics of a drug um, or pharmacokinetics of that patient, I should say, um, how they actually are able to absorb, distribute, metabolize, and eliminate the drug. Adverse reactions, on the other hand, can occur at standard or inappropriate doses, so they can occur regardless of dose. They arise when other drugs are given concurrently, very commonly, right? So there's a lot of contraindications. You don't want to use this with that and that with this, and um, they can lead to adverse reactions. Um, adverse reactions can also occur as a result of altered drug pharmacokinetics. So same sort of thing that can cause side effects. There's a few things that I would like to mention about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics um, when it comes to diseases. So an animal that has cardiovascular, kidney, or liver disease can ha seriously, um, that can seriously change the pharmacokinetics of a drug. Cardiovascular disease while it may seem to affect primarily the distribution of a drug, actually has effects on pretty much all of pharmacokinetics, and here is why. So if you have an animal with cardiovascular disease, that alters the distribution of the blood flow to that animal's tissues. More blood goes to the brain and the heart because we have to preserve the function of those organs. We have to pre preserve perfusion of those organs. Um, and that means that the the organs that suffer, the gastrointestinal, hepatic, renal systems. So that means the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of that drug can be affected. Because look what we're affecting, gastrointestinal, so that's absorption, and sometimes elimination, hepatic, there's our metabolism, renal, there's our elimination. Um, so all of this is being affected, and of course the distribution because of the cardiovascular system itself. Patients with chronic diseases, and especially things like cardiovascular disease, tend to be on multiple drugs already. So they also have a greater chance of drug interactions and or side effects. Kidney disease, of course, we get decreased drug elimination. So many drugs go through the kidneys for elimination. So if we have decreased drug elimination, that means that we're gonna have higher plasma drug concentrations. That means 
in turn, that we're going to have a higher risk of adverse drug reactions or toxicity because the effective dose of that drug is going to be a lot higher. We're going to get higher concentrations. So dosage adjustments in this case would be recommended for any drug that is primarily excreted by the kidney. We'd want to decrease how much we give of those. Uh, drugs associated with an increased risk of side effects in a patient with kidney disease. So certain medications will say do not use in patients with kidney disease for whatever reason. A lot of times it is because of the decreased elimination, but um, but certainly some drugs uh, are, are specifically contraindicated. Um, increased fluid retention. So these guys do have increased fluid retention. What does that mean? We get a, we're going to get an alteration of the volume of distribution of drugs because there's so much more fluid being retained in the body. The drug has more places it needs to go. In that case, potentially, uh, it might have a decreased volume of distribution. It may not work as well. And acids and phosphate binders are commonly used with kidney disease, and these can actually decrease the absorption of antibiotics, among other things. So we need to be aware of that. liver disease. So the liver is, of course, the primary site of drug metabolism. It houses the enzymes that convert lipophilic drugs to water-soluble metabolites for excretion by the kidneys. Hmm. So that means that if we have liver disease, some drugs are not going to get changed into a form where they can be eliminated deficiently from the body. So this is really tricky. It's difficult to predict the need for dosage adjustments with these guys. So if you have an animal with liver failure, you might consider adjusting the dose for certain drugs like metronidazole, benzodiazepines, things that we know uh, need to be, say, conjugated or changed in order to be either effective or eliminated. So, so drugs that we know are, are really susceptible to build up, let's say, if they can't be properly eliminated. There are some effects on drug PK that go along with aging. So normal aging changes um, involve a change in body composition. So we get increased fat, decreased lean muscle mass and, uh, and total body water. We also get that redistribution of blood flow to the brain and the heart. Remember, we have to preserve perfusion of those tissues as a priority over anything else. That affects the distribution of drugs. Um, so for instance, water-soluble drugs should be dosed then based on lean weight to avoid excessive plasma concentrations. These animals will sometimes come in looking really overweight, but remember their, their actual muscle mass is lower. So if we have a water-soluble drug that wants to be in the muscle, uh, within the muscle tissue, we have to remember that this animal actually has a lot less muscle tissue than a younger animal. So we want to dose based on lean weight and forget about the extra fat that might be hanging around. Does that make sense? So say I have like a 70 pound lab coming in who looks to be about a four on five body condition score. If you're dealing, especially if you're dealing with a water soluble drug, you're going to want to dose that animal if it's an older animal, especially at, you know, maybe, maybe 60 pounds. Um, so you're going to dose based on approximate lean weight. There's decreased drug absorption from the gastrointestinal tract because remember we have that redistribution of blood flow to the brain and the heart, which is taking it away from these other organs. So we get decreased hepatic metabolism, decreased renal function, uh, sorry, decreased renal excretion. And of course, reduced kidney function has the most significant impact on drug disposition because if the kidney is not getting rid of the drug, we are going to have drug building up and building up in the body. So let's talk a bit more about adverse drug reactions. Dose-dependent drug reactions are predictable. So they affect all members of a species and or multiple species. Basically, we know we give this dose of the drug and it's quite possible that this is going to happen. These are predictable reactions. The likelihood of a reaction increases as the dose increase, increases, which, which is what dose dependent means. So the more we give of this drug, the more likely we are to see uh, reactions. So in these cases, we want to use therapeutic drug monitoring to help prevent 
drug reactions and confirm whether the drug is actually responsible for whatever we're seeing in that animal that we suspect to be a drug reaction. Uh, the treatment usually for adverse drug reactions is, or dose dependent ones is dose reduction, right? Or brief, brief withdrawal from the drug. Idiosyncratic drug reactions are different because they're unpredictable. They only affect a small portion of the animals that we're treating, and they may or may not affect multiple species. They are not dose dependent, so the risk of reaction isn't determined by the dose. It's independent. Um, they don't occur immediately, usually, so often it takes several days of treatment before we see these reactions. And then there's commonly an immune system response, so like a fever, antibody production, that sort of thing, that goes along with it versus, uh, sorry, idiosyncratic reactions. They're like allergic reactions, right? Um, treatment, how do we treat these? Again, drug withdrawal. In this case, drug avoidance, especially if there's a potential allergy. I did mention therapeutic drug monitoring a couple of slides ago. What is it? It's basically the periodic measurement of the amount of drug in the blood. We recommend it if the pharmacokinetics of a drug varies significantly among individuals, and there are certain drugs that that's very much the case. Uh, one animal you can give us, you know, you can give a dose and it'll have a really high concentration in the blood. Another animal you can give that same dose and they'll have a really low concentration. So there's individual variation. Or if the drug has a narrow therapeutic range, we need to be very careful about how much we give. We need it to be effective, but we don't want to overdose. So then we use therapeutic drug monitoring quite commonly. The goal of a drug monitoring is to optimize the plasma concentrations of that drug in order to maximize its efficiency and to minimize the toxicity. Again, we don't want to overdose these guys. These drugs need to be monitored in order to make sure we keep them at a safe and effective level. The reliability of therapeutic drug monitoring is really dependent on a few things, especially on the timing and the number of blood samples that are collected. So timing is, is the one I want to really focus on here because a lot of drugs um, really need to be measured at a very specific time after they've been given. So a lot of drugs that may be like four hours or six hours or sometimes more or sometimes less. But we need to know when that drug was given so that we can properly um, analyze and assess the concentration of that drug in the bloodstream. What I mean by that is that, you know, you remember that graph where I that I showed you about the steady state? So you remember how the drug concentrations were going up and down, there were peaks and troughs? That's really important because if you test a drug, say, two hours after you gave it and it's halfway up, up its climb, then you're not going to know what the peak concentrations really are. You need to measure that drug when it's at its peak concentration. So say that's four hours after you give it, um, then we're going to want to make sure to take a, a blood sample at the pro a proper time. The TDM really requires appropriate sample collection and handling as well. Certain drugs could potentially degrade if left at room temperature, that sort of thing. The drug being tested will dictate the type of sample that's needed. So phenobarbital is one of the ones that we test most commonly. And there will always be, from your reference laboratory, a book that tells you what kind of sample that they need, but be very, very careful with this. So for phenobarb, serum or plasma, so EDTA, um, those are probably the most common ones that we need to use, potassium bromide and levothyroxine. Those are serum samples. If you look in your book, um, table 27.5, this is McKernan, uh, you should find some more sample collection guidelines there. So normally if I were uh, you know, teaching this in front of a class, I would ask if there are any questions, but certainly if you do have any questions, please feel free to email or um, write some comments on the website or whatever you want to do. Um, there are down here, let me see if I can get my laser pointer. Um, some videos here at the bottom, which are pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics made simple. Um, I didn't include them in the in the actual video here, uh, but if you want to go find them, you can either search on YouTube or take down this URL and give it a go. Um, these really help if you're having any confusion at all about uh, PK and PD.
I'm not sure if you guys have the applied pharmacology for veterinary technicians or not, so I thought I'd leave this in here. So I do recommend that if you do have that book, read chapter one, complete the review questions at the end of the chapter, and then um, if you're still having any issues, I, I do recommend looking at those videos that I mentioned on the last slide. If um, if you don't have that book, uh, McKernan has a great chapter. I think it. Well, I think it's 27 um, on pharmacology, and I do recommend that instead that you can look through there, through their um, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics uh, intro. So any questions, give me a call, give me an email, whatever, and I'd be happy to answer them. But I hope you guys all enjoyed pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and uh, we'll see you again soon.